so our whole life turned upside down when she said, I want a divorce um, because I'm in love with, uh, with your friend and we're, he's going to leave his wife and we're going to be married. Well, Harrison, first of all, congratulations on your new book launch. Thank you. I'm, this book has been like the weirdest alien baby and I'm so happy that we have finally given birth to it. It has been a long, this has been a three, four, five year, um, uh, um, uh, term of carrying this ba this weird book baby. And so we're so glad and happy to have it out there in the world for uh, everybody who's watching and listening to read. Well, I'm so excited. I, I got an audible, so I can't wait to listen to the audio version of it. Normally I read, but you're just so funny that I want it to capture that cadence of how you, you know, you think. And I just, I love your, your humor. I love how, I just feel like it's something that God's using in this generation to help us to get over some of the intensity and the emotionalism that's happened out there, the, the wrong kind of emotions, and yeah. also the trauma that we've all experienced together. And so when I listen to people like you who break down stories and you you pick apart things that not all of us see because of the unique gifts that's on your life. But talk to us about humor. Like, how did you get involved? How did you become a humorist? How did you become somebody who, I mean, I saw your TED Talk and I was dying, just going, mm -hmm. how did he do this? That TED Talks of all places <laughs> back a few years ago. So talk to us about your journey. Um, well, um, I'm incredibly talented. You're exactly right about that. Um, oh, thank you. No, really. Um, I've been funny my whole life. I mean, a lot of people are naturally funny and, you know, you could have a whole podcast series about what makes somebody funny, you yeah. know, uh, in my second book, congratulations, who are you again, which, uh, came out about five years ago. I talked about the sad clown theory of comedy. You know how, it, when you write funny stories, uh, journalists always invariably ask, like, are all funny people really sad? Like, are they, you know, it's this idea of sort of the the uh, the laughing, crying clown. Yeah. Um, but it so my, and yes, the short answer is yes. Like humor and jokes and comedy come out of brokenness, mm -hmm. out of acknowledging that something is broken in the world and the perception versus the reality, or we say X, but really we all know that Y is what's really going on. Yeah. And uh, the fish out of water idea. I mean, I, a lot of comedians were picked on or had strange uh, either deeply or just uh, lightly traumatic experiences as children. Um, and so in a sense, yes, I think all funny people are, uh, <laughs> learned that as a survival mechanism. But here's the thing. I don't think it's just comedians who are sad inside. I think every human on the planet is sad inside. And uh, you deal with that pain in different ways. You bottle it up, you, you know, bottle it up, you, uh, you run it out. You know, I have a friend who is a big runner and whenever she's like mad or angry or whatever, she goes for a run. That's how she yeah. gets uh, but funny people, that's how they get theirs out. And we do that. I, I think as a culture, we're so much more open to talking about trauma and pain than we used to be. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of changes in culture that aren't great. But that's one that's really positive uh, that we are. It's OK to say that you're not OK right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that's uh, that that's a fertile minefield for comedians. Well, it's funny because I heard Chris Rock one time say, um, I can say anything as a comedian and be not get canceled, although now comedians are getting canceled too. But he's talking about politics and some of the things he was saying. And he goes, and I can make everyone laugh at it, but I can tell the complete truth. Yes. And you can't do that in any other genre to tell the complete truth and get people to laugh at it. And I just thought it's so true. Like when you listen to certain people, it's like your guard goes down, mm -hmm. your awareness goes up. You, you, We all laugh at the same kinds of things. And it's just it's one of the most disarming things that there is. And so you've been doing this for a while. Like what's some of your favorite experiences as far as being able to do this as a career? Uh, well, I, I feel uh, very fortunate to be able to, to do this for a living. Uh, it was incredibly difficult. I, I'm not a naturally funny person. I was a cut up in class um, and I was a, a it, whether I was in Sunday school or in high school, wherever I was, I was being funny. Translating that to the page uh, had, took 10 years. It took me 10 wow. years 
as an adult to figure out how to be as funny on the page as I felt like I was in real life, you know, at a party or at a dinner, whatever. It took forever. Um, I did try stand up for a little while. I tried playwriting. I have a PhD in playwriting, uh, but I was terrible at it. That's what I learned. <laughs> I got a PhD to learn that I was terrible at playwriting. It's um, good it didn't cost much then. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I uh, I tried stand up. Stand up felt very. Um, this is not a uh, a dig against stand up comics, but it felt so. Every comedian I met, uh, I was in graduate school at the time. They all seemed so like angry. They were so angry. Wow. And I thought I do not want to spend the next ten years hanging out with these guys. Uh, they're not all that way, but the ones I met were. And so I really wanted to write funny books. Books like. Um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or A Confederacy of Dunces. Uh, I wanted to write books that were as funny as the Looney Tunes were to me as a kid. <clears throat> and But yet, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think I've all, also, and maybe this is because, um, uh, because I'm an artist and because I'm a believer, I've always wanted to, I've always felt that stories should have some substance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I used to think that was because, you know, I was raised evangelical. And so, you know, you're always testifying, you're always witnessing <laughs> you're all, and uh, for better and worse. Um, but but, you know, artists are the same way. Artists all, also feel compelled to always be testifying and witnessing to the truth. Yeah. They see it. And so um, it was my career has been about really marrying these two things, this uh, quirky, oddball sense of humor uh, that's hyperbolic, uh, that that zigs and zags and allows me to sort of talk uh, scandalously sometimes uh, about anything um, with this sensibility that wants to say something meaningful. I love books and movies that make me cry, that make me feel, uh, that really, you know, I mean, think about like when you're watching the football movie, Rudy, how you feel in that final scene when he finally gets to play. Like I'm always going for that. I want mm. that feeling in everything I write, every chapter, every story, every book. And so this has really been what my career has been about. And, you know, you're always looking for a subject. That's the one of the hardest things about being a working artist is like, what are you going to talk about now? And it took me forever to realize with my first book, what I really wanted to talk about was the South, the American South, my dad, uh, football and deer hunting and all that. Like that was yeah. my Topic. It took me forever to realize that that was my topic. Uh, and my second book was all, you saw the TED Talk, it was all about the American dream and writing and creativity and how to find your purpose in life. That was my topic. And um, a few years ago, I was you know, trying to figure out what my third book would be about. And I thought I would write about faith. I had all these funny stories about growing up in the church. Uh, I was raised in the Church of Christ uh, in rural Mississippi. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, so it's like um, it's like uh, you know the Southern Baptist Church, but without without pianos uh, in a way. Um, I grew up like that, uh, but with a very inquisitive mind. Got very much in trouble for bringing my you know Stephen Hawking a brief history of time to Sunday school to read aloud to everybody. Um, and then I went to a Presbyterian college. Uh, and I became a very bad Presbyterian for a while, and I went in and out of churches. Um, and we're at a we're at a Presbyterian church now. There's a lot about faith in this new book. I was writing. I wanted to write a funny book about religion and God, and what I describe as like my lifelong battle with the reigning heavyweight champion of the universe, who is God. <laughs> you know, like. Um, just struggling with doubt and faith and the church and all of this stuff. And I was writing that book. And in the midst of writing that book, uh, my wife told me she wanted a divorce because she was wow. in love with our neighbor and they wanted to get married and they wanted to, uh, she wanted to divorce me and go marry him. He was one of my friends and, um, what a good one. <laughs> yeah. What a great pal. Um, yeah. uh, so when that happened, obviously, um, I stopped writing every book. I was just reeling. My whole life exploded. We have three young children. Uh, at the time, they were, I don't know, uh, seven, nine, and 11, something like that. Wow. And uh, three girls. And we live in a small town, Savannah, Georgia. My wife worked at a Christian school. Um, and I knew that 
her, she would have to leave that job if this came out uh, for better and worse. She would not be able to work there anymore. Uh, so our whole life turned upside down when she said, I want a divorce um, because I'm in love with uh, with your friend and we're he's going to leave his wife and we're going to be married. My wife's father uh, was an ordained minister and he did the same thing to her family. He had an affair and left his wife and children. And um, that's what this so I immediately put this other funny book about religion aside. And I was like, so I was just focused on that. And then after a few months, I started writing journaling, just trying to sort of sort through the wreckage of my marriage. Yeah. And um, and that's what became this new book, How to Stay Married. It's it seems like it's a book about the affair that my wife had. Uh, that's just the marketing. Uh, it's this is really a mystery novel. And the mystery is, you know, like a great mystery novel. Somebody dies at the beginning and what dies is our marriage. Yeah. And the and so I am the detective trying to figure out who killed this thing. Is it really dead? Can it be brought back? And I go into a series of investigations. I, of course, interrogate my wife about how this happened. I didn't know it. It was for many years she was in love with him and I didn't know it. Uh, I also question God and I have a, a, a many wrestling matches with God in the book, yeah. uh, as well as with uh, uh, institutional religion. Um, I had a there's a, a several chapters about the really big, old, historic downtown church that we were in at the time that all this came out and how they um, approached what happened, how what they recommended we do. Uh, which I thought was well intended, but maybe not the best the best thing. And you can read sure. the book and find out what they what they recommended. So the whole book is about finding out who killed this marriage. And, and one of the things that I learned in the book, and I'm not giving anything away here, uh, is that um, I am as guilty as my wife and this other man for making my marriage not a pleasant place to be. And wow. I discover that not not at the beginning. It takes me a few chapters to sort of have that insight. And that completely blows the case wide open, so to speak. And um, I am joined by so many friends who came alongside us and loved us. There are so many twists and turns in the story. There's not one huge revelation. There's another chapter called Second Revelations where I learned even more about what, what happened. And uh, the climax is pretty wild of this book. It's a wild journey. Well, I mean, and this is your life story too. So what a cliffhanger that we, our listeners and viewers have to actually read the book to know what happened. But yeah. I think it's so interesting because like a lot of people who approach their story with humor or, or who come from kind of the background you do as far as probably the amount of writing you've done and the amount of a career you've lived. A lot of times people will get kind of like a victim mentality on them. And when they write their story, it's very kind of self-serving, mm -hmm. but it sounds like the way that you've written it, just like you wrote your first book, your first book was like so profound to me because I was laughing the whole way, but I was also like watched you get empathy for your dad. Mm -hmm. And like, actually like was so touched by it. That it was like a crying moment. It was like one of those things where you're like, you live, uh, the reader lives the story with you. That's why it was a bestseller. Cause I mean, how can we not, how can we not live the story with you? So I'm super, super in a concerned way. Like I need to know what happens now. <laughs> this yeah. is our first meeting. So I'm like, I personally am glad I bought the audible copy because I need to know what happens now. But when, when you look at this, this big picture of what happens, cause you can't tell us cause it, it would give it away. But, but how much did your, like, you're talking about it. Like you wrote the story. And that's how you kind of unraveled it. Was that really the process that happened as you were writing this and then that unraveled it? Or are you just, that's your language for how you went on the journey? Um, it's sort of both. I mean, um, in a sense, this book is like battlefield reportage. I'm sort of, uh, if it's very present and urgent as you read, things are ha like I am, you're, you're kind of in it with me on the front lines of what yeah. happened. Um, obviously, I... I wrote a lot of this story in a sense as it was happening because the wow. details were so vivid and it, you know, obviously I had, I had bigger fish to fry than writing a book. I had to save my family. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, at one point I was a single dad with three young daughters in the house. I had two jobs. I had to get them ready for school every day, cook all the meals, 
uh, clean the house, uh, earn all the money, pay all the bills. Uh, my wife left. She completely left us. And my wife is the absolute most amazing mother I've ever known. And for her to leave us, I knew that um, it was as hard for her as it was for us. Uh, it was uh, there's, just, there's so much going on in the story. Um, so I wasn't writing uh, like, you know, like I wasn't getting up every day and like writing everything that happened the day before necessarily, because when you're a single dad with three daughters, you, the first thing you do when you get up in the morning is make school lunches and yeah. uh, make sure all the school uniforms are clean. But I, I sold time away um, throughout this experience, both before she left, because uh, because like I said, there's just a lot. It's not just like she told me she wanted a divorce and then left the next day. It's never that easy. Uh, maybe it is in the movies, but in real life, uh, for example, um, she told she she told me that she wanted a divorce and she was going to marry this guy. Um, she thought I would leave because I was the man and that's, you know, she was going to stay at home with the kids and I was going to run off and go, you know, stay at my mother's apartment or at a friend's house. And she was shocked that I didn't leave. Uh, and then I realized I couldn't kick her out either because she was going to have a hysterectomy and talk about like symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism here. Like she was having her motherhood removed from her body. And so like, what am I supposed to do? Like I, all those verses about, um, you know, justice and mercy, do justice, love mercy, uh, all those like love your enemy, all that stuff came into play trying to help me figure out what do I do? Do I kick my wife out when she's got like, you know, abdomen sutures? Like, is that OK? Oh, my gosh. Um, oh, my gosh. So I had a lot going on. And so obviously was not writing the book as it was all happening. But I did write the book um, sort of very soon after the event uh, of it. Yeah. And so I might be writing one day about something that happened a month before or the year before I, I was, I wrote the chapter, the final uh, couple of chapters wrote, uh, wrote them about a week or two after the events in the final chapter. But of course, as you work with your editor a year later, two years later, as the book is getting ready for publication, you're kind of going back over it mm -hmm. and opening it. Um, so in a sense, yes, it was kind of written in real time. Um, yeah, would it be a different book if I waited five years and wrote it? Yeah, it would be a it would be a different book. There'd be a different tone to it. Um, you can e even you can sense that in from the first chapter to the last chapter, you can sense that I'm in the middle of the biggest fight of my life. Yeah. And if I had written it five years after these events, you that urgency and immediacy wouldn't have been there. It would have there would have been a different tone to it. But yeah. I really wanted readers to get what that felt like. To be well, and it's interesting, too, because psychologists talk about it. When you're going through a marriage breakdown, you immediately begin to rewrite your history. Yeah. So you, you didn't really have time to because you were living it. So that the fact that you gave us kind of this, this moment of your life and your wife, the fact that she was willing to be vulnerable in this, too, and you gave us this moment of your life, I can't wait to see what it will do for people. Because I know there's a war against marriage right now. Just It feels like marriage is is a hard place. But even more than that, it's really, it's really human connection. It's really how connected are we? How, how, how much are we living out of a place of, of true love and true knowing each other and the whole thing. So above even marriage is our connection to God. And I think it's so interesting that you've used your platform, your career to go there. Like you've used your life to go there and like really help people. And like you said, you could, most, most people are stand-up comics are just angry people who have a lot of jokes. You actually have a message in your, in your, and you're, I think, I think a lot of Christians are frustrated comics, you know, <laughs> a lot yeah. of pastors are like frustrated comics. And, are. and I think for you, you're like a comic who's like actually giving out of this place of vulnerability. And I just so appreciate that. How do people get a hold of the book? Um, so the book is available anywhere books are sold. They can find it on Amazon. They can just Google how to stay married, Harrison Scott Key, and they'll be able to find my website. They, their local independent bookstore will probably have it. If not, they can order it if they want to get it that way. You can download the audiobook from Audible. You can get it through Amazon. Uh, what's so cool about the book, audiobook and the book itself is that, so my wife wrote a chapter, one of the chapters near the end, nice. she wrote. And uh, and so I I perform the audiobook, and then when we get to her chapter, she does her chapter. Wow, wow. So you'll hear my voice and you'll get to hear her voice.
Well, in a time when people really need hope and they need to, they need to hear someone else's process. And I love the, you know, the, the old cliche of laughter is the best medicine. And I think, you know, a book like this, you give us an opportunity to have an injection, so to speak, of truth and God and, and love. So I'm so appreciate it. Thanks for writing the book and thanks for being here today for our show. Well, thanks for having me. I hope people uh, can get something from this story. For sure. They will. I know I'm going to. We're going to listen to it, I think, tomorrow. It comes out for us tomorrow, so we'll have it. And we're going to start listening to it as a couple and just live awesome. your story with you. I'll tell you what I think. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.